There is, uh, I don't know, can you smell, can you smell the dinner cooking? I, I, I can kind of smell that. Uh, bullet, or, uh, these are new directories, they're outside, they're picture directories, so if you haven't picked one of those up, please pick that up. Stay for lunch today, because we'd love to have you there. If you brought something great, if you didn't, there's plenty. Um, so stay for lunch today. Little blankets, we're gathering these up. We need about 100 of them. Um, the women's group are putting a card on them and then we will take them to Avamir and then also to Regency. And they love these because they just make a nice little lap and throw. So if you can, grab one of those and bring them in over the next few weeks. If you look at your bulletin, there's a lot in it. But this little piece right here that tears off, you can put your name and address. If you got a prayer concern, drop it in the box at the very back there today. And then I just got to say, God is good. All and all the time, God is good. And you know, Kelly and I have gone through some experiences this year, but you know, we've seen God's goodness in all of it as we go through them. Um, Pastor will share, I've got a surgery coming up. But you know, I know the end of the story, and God is good because I have my salvation in Jesus Christ, and I know where I stand, and I know the end of the story. But what are you thankful for? Let's just take a minute and just give me a shout out. What are you thankful for? All right, the church, yeah, all right. Seaside, you're, you're thankful for Seaside. All right, thank you, Maria. Family. My wife. What's that? My wife. Your wife, all right, yeah. She's a trooper, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Celebrate recovery. Uh, yeah. Recovery, celebrate recovery, yeah. Powerhouse. Powerhouse, all right. Got the powerhouse ladies here today. What's that? Someone else shouted something. Grief share, okay, thank you, yeah. Bible studies. What? Bible studies, yeah, and there's a lot in your bulletin, yeah. Friends, grandkids. All right, Eric's new apartment, all right, all right. Pastor John, we're thankful for Pastor, absolutely. You know, we just need to remember that uh, we need to live a life of gratitude, and so. Um, be sure to thank God for the gifts that you have and uh, thank him for the salvation we have through his son. But anyway, Pastor, that's, that's all I got. All right, thank you, Scott. Good morning. I got up to grab this because I didn't want Scott, I didn't know if he'd try to pick it up. He, he's been showing up Thursday mornings when they're in town. He's out of town quite a bit because with um, Kelly's, you know, treatments, which I think are going very well. But he showed up several Thursday mornings in flip-flops without socks. And it's, it's cold now, right? Thursday morning, it's cold. 5.30 in the morning, it's cold. And so I think we teased him a little bit. And then this last Thursday, he showed up with some kind of a, a little more of a shoe type on his foot. And, and I comment on that, and I got your socks on. He pulled them up, and there are no, no socks. Then it, then it occurred to me, well, he's not wearing socks so much because it's hard to get them on because of this issue in his neck. And so Scott is having surgery tomorrow, and we will pray for Scott. Uh, and Scott has had a history of, you know, spine issues. And so this is, in a sense, not new, although the, the others have been lower down. Um, so but we'll pray that the doctor will be successful and and will bring, uh, you know, relief in terms of pain and, and also do some good surgically. But Scott's not the only one we're praying for today. Um, Paula Otzenberger is up here, and Paula had a fall yesterday, and you can tell she had a fall. You actually look pretty good except for that lower lip, which doesn't, a little, little swollen there. Well, that is... Yeah, well, that's, that's good news. I don't know, the Thanksgiving dinner might be a little harder to eat or to enjoy, but she was at the ER yesterday and was scanned, and so all of those scans came out well. But we'll pray for Paula. Also, Robin. Robin, I was talking to her. Now, Robin was baptized just a couple weeks ago, and Robin, it looks like, is going to be moving to Hepner, and that's concerned with health issues, and, and so that is a move that makes sense to you. 
and I don't know when that's going to happen exactly, but I just wanted to mention it, um, and we should pray for Robin as, as that process moves forward. Uh, Mark is here today, and Jackie, we reported that Jackie has COVID, which she has tested positive for COVID, but she is doing well and doesn't show any symptoms. Now, we somehow sent an email earlier this week saying she had COVID and was not doing well. So we corrected that because actually, oh, she did. Yeah, that's true. She played, she commented back, fix that false information. So she is doing well. So we're thankful for that. She is now in the Tri-Cities. Um, Grace Fredrickson, broken hip. Grace is, I don't think she's here today, but she's going to be released from Regency, I believe tomorrow or Tuesday. And she's doing well. And Grace is such a positive person. And so that's a real praise. Um, we continue to pray for Janice Eppenbaugh and for Wayne, uh, just with their situation. And I don't know if Steve Trott's here today or not, but we've been praying for Steve. He's a little embarrassed that we pray for him. He commented to me after church. Um, but I've mentioned your name again. I apologize. But um, we've been praying for Danette, Danette Berg, who I do not know her personally. She's Kathy, Kathy O'Neill's neighbor, and she has cancer. And it's considered to be terminal cancer. And so a long, a long list here of, of individuals. I don't, I'm going to pray. I might miss a few of these. They've all been mentioned, though. Um, keep them in your prayers. And so let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for the day that you've given to us. And we do acknowledge that every worship service is an audience with the King of Kings. You are our King. You are our God. You, your Son is our Savior, and He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, I thank you for that song that we started with today. We, we've been reminded of the great God that you are. We've also been reminded that you are a good God. And so we affirm both of these truths. You are the God who is great, exalted above all. You're also the God who is good. And we see your goodness primarily in the sending of Jesus into this world uh, to bear our sins. And so as it is, a, it is today a Thanksgiving day, and it's also we are on the edge of the whole, the whole Christmas season. We already see in Stanfield the Christmas decorations are coming, coming up. And so we, we are reminded of your goodness through Christ. But you're also good to give the Spirit, to send the Spirit into this world and into our hearts. And we ask that uh, the Spirit would minister to us today, uh, that he would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, to worship you through song, to worship you through prayer, through the word preached. And so we just want to commit every part of this service to you and every person who is here today. We ask that your spirit will be poured out upon us and that you will minister to us. And Lord God, we do know of a lot of needs within our community and within our own congregation. And so we do pray for Scott today as he will have surgery tomorrow in Tri-Cities. And we are thankful for modern medicine. We're thankful for a surgeon who... Uh, knows what is going on in Scott's neck. Um, or I think clarity is scheduled to, to move Scott forward uh, because this is a surgery that is needed. And we ask that you would bless that individual as he does his work tomorrow, that you will guide his eyes, guide his hands, the machinery that he uses, and that you will use this man to bring healing to Scott's neck and that he will that Scott will recover quickly and well and that he will feel a, a great reduction in pain. Uh, Lord we pray for Robin as she is uh, thinking uh, that a move is in her future. We thank you for 
being able to watch or participate in her baptism just a couple of weeks ago and just the, the knowledge that uh, you are at work in this world and you are at work in our lives and you are at work in Robin's life and so we thank you for that and the encouragement that that is to all of us and we just ask your blessing upon her. We pray for Steve today and just ask Lord that you would be with his doctors as they treat him. Uh, we lift Paula up to you today. We thank you that she is here today and that she was not um, seriously injured in this fall. Uh, the fall was described to me in some pretty, well, somewhat gruesome terms. And so we're just thankful uh, that, she, that she was not seriously hurt. Um, we pray for Jackie. We continue to pray for Jackie. We just continue to lift her up to you. And we pray, Lord, that you will touch her body, that you will be at work that she will strengthen her lungs. We're thankful that she's been able to leave the Portland Hospital and, and come to the Tri-Cities where it's much easier for Mark uh, to, to visit her and, and uh, to care for her. And so we just, uh, we thank you, Lord, for her. And Father, for each of these situations, I know there's others as well, we're grateful that Grace is soon to be out of the hospital. We think of Kathy O'Neill's neighbor, uh, who is struggling with cancer, and, and I think probably struggling with cancer without, without the knowledge of the gospel or the knowledge of Christ as Savior. And so we pray, Lord, for her. Uh, but Lord, we thank you that we are in your hands, uh, that your hands are wise, your hands are strong, your hands are good. And so help us to trust you in all things. Help us to believe the gospel. Help us, Lord, to rejoice in you through the remainder of this service. We just commit this time to you, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you'd stand with me, let's say together the Lord's Prayer, and then I want to read a passage of Scripture to you. But first, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I want to read to you from Psalm 90. Uh, we're going to sing in a few moments a new hymn written by Sovereign Grace Music that is based on Psalm 90. One of the things about the hymn we're going to sing, which really stands out to me, is that the hymn is based on Psalm 90, and, and you'll, you'll hear that, you'll see that as you sing it, in terms of what it says about God and what it says about us. But there is something conspicuous by its absence in the hymn that is present in Psalm 90. And that's the idea of the displeasure of God, or even the wrath of God. Psalm 90, the context is the children of Israel in the wilderness, dying in the desert because of their stubborn, unrepentant hearts. And it seems to me that when we sing the hymn, there's an acknowledgement that redemptive history has moved forward. And so God is eternal and we are in God's hands. But through Christ, through Christ, the wrath of God has been satisfied. So let me read to you Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening 
it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as, for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to your children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. As you remain standing, I'm going to ask the worship team to go up, and I'm going to read to you a paragraph. Listen to Luther. I love Luther. Luther writes of corporate worship through song. I wish to see all arts, principally music, in the service of him who gave and created them. Music is a fair and glorious gift of God. I would not for the world forego my humble share of music. Singers are never sorrowful, but are merry and smile through their troubles in song. Music makes people kinder, gentler, more staid and reasonable. I am strongly persuaded that after theology, there is no art that can be placed on the level with music. For besides theology, music is the only art capable of affording peace and joy to the human heart. Listen to these words. The devil flees before the sound of music almost as much as before the word of God. <laughs> Today we are continuing in our study of Galatians. And so if you have a Bible, I'd ask you to turn with me to Galatians. If you don't have a Bible, there's still hope for you. You could probably find a Bible underneath a row of chairs in front of you. And I think it would be helpful uh, if you had a text open and could follow along with your eyes instead of just listening to me. Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. So that is the text. Let me read, read it to you. Now Paul writes, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Now the first thing I want to say about this text is that if you have a text open, I want to draw your attention to two phrases. One of them is found in verse 23, 
and the other is found in verse 26. And those phrases are as follows. In verse 23, we have the words, under the law. And in verse 26, we find the words, in Christ. And I want to suggest to you that these are mutually exclusive categories. You are either under the law or you are in Christ. It's like an individual who, well, you're married or you're single, you can't be both at the same time. Now, to be under the law, as Paul is using the phrase in this verse, and by the way, Paul uses this expression a total of 11 times in his 13 epistles. He means by the phrase under the law to be under its authority or under its jurisdiction. He means by this phrase to be under the old covenant. Now, when he uses the phrase in Christ, he is telling us that redemptive history has moved forward. To understand this passage, you really do need to think in terms of, of history, but specifically in terms of redemptive history and how the story of God isn't static. The story of God is moving forward. So we were at one time under the law, but as redemptive history has moved forward, we are now, Paul says, in Christ. We are not old covenant believers. We are new covenant believers. The old covenant is called old because it is old. And it's been replaced by that which is new. I said that Paul uses this statement under law 11 times. Let me just give you a couple other examples from Romans chapter 6. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Or right here in the book of Galatians, in chapter 5 and verse 18, we have these words. But if you are led by the Spirit, now, in Galatians, the indwelling spirit is the sign of the new covenant. So it's almost as if, I think Paul is saying here, to be led by the spirit is to be under the new covenant. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Because again, history has moved forward. Christ has come. Remember how Paul begins this book in the opening statement, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Verse 4, who gave him for our sins. In other words, redemptive history has moved forward. We're living on the other side of this. We're living in this age of grace. We're looking back on Christ and what he's accomplished for us. We're justified by his blood, by faith in his work. Now sadly, many religious people and even some churchgoers, you've heard me say this many times in the past, there are various categories of lost people. One of the categories of lost people is the category of religious and lost. The world is filled with people who are religious and lost. I hope no one today in this room is in that category. And if you are in that category, I hope you don't remain in that category. In a certain sense, I hope there are people in the room who are religious and lost because we'd like you to come to Christ. But John Stott writes as follows. These are good words. He says, Many go to Moses and the law to be condemned, 
and they stay in this unhappy bondage. They're religious but lost. They are still living in the Old Testament. Their religion is a grievous yoke, hard to be born. They have never gone to Christ to be set free. When I read those words this week, it made me think of the book Pilgrim's Progress. How many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress? So the hands that are going up are the winners. <laughs> if your hand did not go up, read Pilgrim's Progress. It is a great, great story. I haven't read it in many years, but I do remember that Christian is living in the city of destruction. And he takes up a book, which of course, the scriptures, and he begins to read this book. And he realizes that he is condemned. He is under the judgment of a righteous God. And so he begins this journey. Evangelist comes and witnesses to him. He flees the city of destruction. He even leaves his family. He forsakes all because he wants the burden on his back to be released. He carries this great burden, the burden of shame, the burden of sin, the burden of guilt. And some people might say, well, guilt, sin, shame, these are not real things. But Christian knew enough to know that the guilt was real, the shame was real, the sin was real. He goes through the slew of despondency. And then he's led by a false teacher to go visit Mr. Legality. And Mr. Legality, you locate his home by making a trek up a very arduous mountain. And if memory serves me right, that mountain is Mount Sinai. And he tries and he labors. See, he's living under Moses. But then evangelist comes to him and says, no, you have wandered from the path. And then finally, Christian finds himself at the place of deliverance. And Bunyan describes that this way. I saw in my dream that just as Christian came up to the cross... There's a cross behind me. Do you need to come to the cross today? Christian came up to the cross, the burden, this burden on his back, representing his sin, his shame, and his guilt. The burden came loose from his shoulders and fell off his back. It began to tumble and continued to do so until it came to the mouth of the tomb. Of course, the tomb of Christ. It then fell into the tomb, and I saw it no more. Of course, at that moment, you're supposed to say, Amen. There's a, you're all stayed Baptists, I realize it. <laughs> but you're supposed to say, Amen. You're supposed to say, So there is a way that my burden can come off my back and be so taken away from me that I see it no more forever. I'm not condemned by it. I am set free. And so Paul is talking about that in this text. We're no longer under law. Law is good because law comes from God. But I cannot keep the law. As we saw several weeks ago, verse 13 in chapter 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The law condemns, the law curses. And so to be no longer under the law, but in Christ and in his righteousness. Now let me hasten to add at this moment, because it seems right to do so. I am aware that John Calvin talks at length about the revelatory function of the law in the Christian's life. 
Calvin says the law is good because the law comes from God. The law points us in terms of how to live a life as regenerate people that is pleasing unto the Lord. Psalm 19, Psalm 119. The psalmist rejoice in the beauty of God's righteousness revealed in the law. I am not denying that. All I am saying is that that is not Paul's point in this text. Right? We can look elsewhere for that. But Paul's point in this text is much more akin to the second use of the law. The law condemns us so that we will see our need for a new mediator, a new covenant, a new way. The law drives us to the grace of God. And so what we were under the law, that's verses 23 and 24. Let me read these verses to you. Chapter 3, verse 23. Now before faith came, now don't read those words and interpret them as there was no faith, there was no grace under the old covenant. That's not the point. The point is that Christ has come and Christ has brought the new covenant with him. He's inaugurated it in his blood. Before faith came is like saying before Christ came. But that day is now done. Before faith came, Paul goes on to state, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. And of course, that faith has been revealed in Christ, in his person, in his work, in his sinless perfection, as he kept the law perfectly for us. Until Christ came, until the coming of faith would be revealed. Verse 24, so then the law was our, Paul writes, our guardian. Our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Now I want to draw your attention to three different words that Paul uses in verse, two of them in verse 23, one in verse 24, to really further explain and describe to us our former relationship of being under the law and under its condemnation. And so he says here, first of all, verse 23, he says, we were held captive under the law. It's two words in English, it's one word in the Greek New Testament. This word is found a total of four times in the New Testament. And it means to, uh, to be confined or to be imprisoned. One of the other places where this word occurs is in reference to Saul, who became the Apostle Paul. And then he was imprisoned in the city of Damascus. You remember that text? Paul mentions this a couple of times. It's mentioned in Acts. It's mentioned, I think, in 1 Corinthians. But Paul, this, this former persecutor of Christians, has now become a Christian. He is preaching the message he once sought to destroy. There are enemies afoot. There is an army, actually, and they besiege Paul. They capture Paul within the city of Damascus. They're outside the city. The city is placed in lockdown. And how does Paul escape? Well, Luke tells us that their intention was to capture Paul and to kill him. But his disciples at night lower him in a basket from the city wall. And he escapes through the soldiers and his life is spared. That's the word used here. To describe a man under arrest, if you will, in a city besieged and in lockdown. Where if you had a list of most wanted at that moment, 
number one through ten was this guy, Paul. We want him. But he escaped. So that's the first word here. We were held captive under the law. Then the next word, we were imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Now, this word means to hem in, to coop up, or to enclose. Now, we've encountered this word because it was used back in verse 22. I mentioned it last Sunday. Verse 22, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin. The same word. So Paul likes this word. He uses it twice. We were in prison. We were held captive under the law. The law imprisoned us. And last Sunday I shared with you one of the other passages where this word is used. And it's in Luke chapter 5. Or is it chapter 6? I could look there. I think it's chapter 5. But it is that text where Jesus has been preaching to the large crowds of people. And at the end of his sermon... He, uh, he gets on the boat with the disciples. And the disciples have been cleaning their nets because they've fished all night and it has been a fishless fishing experience. You ever had that before? I remember as a little tiny boy, my dad taking my brother and I to a little fishing trip on, I think it was the Sandy River. And we fished what seemed like for hours and just caught nothing. Finally, I think he said, oh, it's, it's hopeless. Reel in your rods. And I think it was my rod. It might have been my brother's rod. It's funny how stories become mixed in your mind. But I think it was my rod. I reeled it in and there was this little tiny fish on the hook. Who knows how long he'd been there. Almost got it in to capture it when it fell off the hook. And that was the end of the fishing trip. Well, in that story, in, in Luke's gospel, Jesus says to the disciples, throw in your nets, and you know what happens, don't you? It is as if every fish in the Sea of Galilee jumps into their nets. And their nets begin to break. And Peter calls his assistant or his co labor his business partner, John and James, and they bring their boat out, and they're filling both boats up with fish, and it seems like the boats might sink. And then Peter, at that moment, it's so interesting what Peter does. I've talked about this before. We would expect Peter, being a good Jewish businessman, to say to Jesus, this is wonderful, come speak these words once a week, we'll all get rich, we'll split the profits 50-50. No, he throws down everything and he bows before Jesus and he says, depart from me, I am a sinful man. You see, Peter experienced what we sang about this morning, he experienced the holiness of God. And he was undone by it. But in that text, the text states that within the nets, they enclosed a great quantity of fish. It's the word used here. They captured a large quantity of fish. Those fish, so to speak, were imprisoned within their nets. So now before the law came, we were held captive, like a man besieged in a city. Under the law, we were imprisoned, like a large group of fish who are imprisoned within nets from which they cannot escape, until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. The pedagogos is the word here in Greek that is translated guardian. Now, almost any word you choose seems like an unfortunate translation because there is not an English equivalent to this particular Greek term, the pedagogos. 
The Pythagogos was an individual who was given a charge. This was a practice within the ancient world. So the Pythagogos would be given a child under his authority and under his care. Now, the King James Version reads something like this, that, that he, he was our schoolmaster. And, and I think that's, a, frankly, a not great rendering. Because when you hear the word schoolmaster, you probably think of a teacher. You might think of your grade school days. I remember my grade school teachers. I have fond memories of all of them. Maybe you don't, but I do. That's not how we should think of this word. Rather, think of a one-house schoolroom, and there's a teacher up there teaching, but the Pythagogos is more like the disciplinarian who walked between the rows of desks with a stick in his hand, and he racked your fingers whenever you got the answer wrong. So the disciplinarian is really a, probably a better sense. So, so the function of the law is we get it wrong and the law whacks us. The law disciplines us. And it doesn't take too long, can I say this, Paula, will you let me say it? We start to look like your lips, <laughs> you know? The law just takes it out on us. Again, the law is good, but we can't keep it. Particularly as unregenerate, sinful, fallen people. So then trying to put some of this together, the law is likened by Paul to a prison guard and to a child's strict disciplinarian. So what are we to make of these two metaphors? The first suggests bondage and the second discipline. The law held us bondage and gave us daily beatings. The law says do, but it doesn't give us the power to do it. Paul says earlier in Galatians, the law cannot give life. It instead points us to the one who is life. As we saw last Sunday, the law convicts, condemns, and curses. Let me read to you again the words of Bunyan. I read these last Sunday. These are autobiographical of the man in his own life. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. For better news the gospel brings, it bids us fly and gives us wings. So every person under the law stands condemned before God. And that's still true today, by the way. We all have the law of God. Even the person on some desert island somewhere in the South Pacific, if there is a desert island in the South Pacific, but on some island in the South Pacific who's never heard of the Ten Commandments, if there is such a person, they still have the law of God written on their hearts. And that law excuses or that law condemns. But we're no longer under the law in the sense that we're looking at it today. Now we're in Christ. And so that brings us to the second half of our text. Let me read these verses to you. But now that faith has come. Again, redemptive histories move forward. Christ has come. Christ has paid the penalty for our sins. We're living in the new covenant. We've passed out of the old covenant. But now that faith has come, did I say Christ has come? The text says now that faith has come, but that means Christ has come. I'm confusing myself. We are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. You're no longer children. That's part of that imagery of guardian. We're, we're little children. But, but now we're, we're said to be the sons of God. But we're the sons of God. It doesn't say through law or through the old covenant. We're sons of God through faith. We could add the word alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. 
For as many as you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. Have you been baptized into Christ Jesus? I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we witnessed a baptism. And, and, and we talked about how a baptism points beyond itself to a greater spiritual reality. And what is that reality? It is our union with Christ. We've been united with Christ in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. And we've been united in Christ so that his righteousness is given to us by faith alone. Now, I'm not a very emotional person. I, I find I'm making a statement I made just a couple of weeks ago. But I had a similar experience as, as I was thinking about this, this idea of the righteousness of Christ and my being clothed in it. And the thought that came to me is that this is an impregnable righteousness. It's just not a barely sufficient righteousness. This is a deep righteousness. The breadth of it, the height of it. And to be wrapped up in this righteousness, do you see how it is impossible for us to be condemned? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So the thought that I had was just the, I was, I was amazed by, by the reality of, of, of the the sufficiency, the all-sufficiency of the righteousness of Christ, by which I am saved to the uttermost. It's not like I'm barely saved. And I don't want to find myself in this situation where so many people... Paul puts it this way, back in chapter 3, verse 3. Chapter 3, verse 3. Listen to these words. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Isn't it easy for a Christian to find himself or herself right in that place? I begin by grace, but boy, I'm striving hard to earn God's favor. And so to realize that through the gospel, we really do right now have the favor of God. If we are in Christ. And then Paul says three things about this, this, this new place in which we find ourselves. Number one, he says, in Christ, we are sons of God. We are sons of God. In Ephesians, we learn that not everyone is a son of God. I'm thinking of chapter 2, verse 3. Remember what chapter 2, verse 3 says? It's talking about those who are outside of Christ. It says, they are by nature children of wrath. So we live in a culture, and we live in a church culture, where it is so popular for preachers to say, you're all God's children. Now that's true in a very restricted sense. God is the creator of all, and in that sense, he is the father of all, but that isn't what Paul has in view here. No, he has in view here that because of our fallenness, because of our sinfulness, we were at one time the children of his wrath, and now by faith, we have become the children of God. And so this is a great and a wonderful truth. Then he says in verse 28, he says, In Christ we are all one. In Christ we are all one. Let me read these words to you. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This makes me think of earlier in Galatians when Peter came to Antioch and Paul confronted Peter to his face because before the coming of certain Jews from Jerusalem, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. But when the Jews showed up and brought their Judaizing tendencies with them, what did Peter do? He withdrew from the Gentiles. 
Oh, those Gentiles, they're still sort of maybe a little bit dirty dogs. And so Paul is saying here, no, through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're all made one. Now, of course, Paul is not saying that there is no such thing in the world as a Jew or a Gentile. Or for that matter, those of different social standing or the category, the binary in Scripture of male versus female. I was helping my dad the other day fill out a form. I had to help him out because it was on a digital format. And, and uh, if it doesn't involve pen and pencil, it might as well be damned in his mind. But so we're, we're going through these questions, and there's questions like, um, have you been convicted of a felony? In fact, I said at one point, you know, if we checked yes to this, you could save quite a bit of money. But at one, it said, do you identify as male, female, or non-binary? And I thought that was kind of fun. I asked him the question, you know. <laughs> so a verse like this is not denying that God has created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. But what it is saying, beloved, is that all of these identities which divide and separate us, don't they? I mean, if you watch the news, Jew and Gentile, Jew and Arab, Jew and Palestinian, they're separated. It's probably still true that the most segregated hour in America is Sunday morning because we've got white churches and black churches. So Paul is stating here that all of those identities are secondary. The primary identity that brings us all together is our union in Christ by which we are the sons of God. Boy, if you could live that out do you recognize how that would totally transform our culture? Particularly this poisonous idea of intersectionality, which is just based on envy and dividing people. The gospel brings people together. It says it doesn't matter ultimately. These are lesser things. We celebrate our unity through Christ as the family of God. And then he concludes, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So what does it mean to be a child of Abraham? You see, now he's taking us back before the Mosaic covenant, back to the Abrahamic covenant, back to promise that we're reconciled to God by way of promise and by way of faith. And so to trust that promise and to, to have the faith of Abraham means that we are the offspring of Abraham. We're part of his family. You want to know what that family looks like? Go home and read Hebrews chapter 11. That's your family. Now we're living in a culture today where there is this new category and it's shocking. And it's troubling, frankly. It's the category called the nuns. If you look at young people in this country, the percentage that identify as none, as in no religious affiliation, it is shocking. There is a falling away from church in this culture, particularly among the young. We're not going to solve that today, but I just want to close with this thought. And I want to read John Stott on our way out. I am not in the category of the nun. I am a Christian. I am part of a body. I have an identity. God is my father. Jesus is my savior, my king, and my brother. And you also are my brothers and sisters because we 
have a common Savior, a common salvation. And so I hope that we recognize how blessed we are to not be strangers at the gate, to not be in the category of none without family, but to belong to the blood-bought family of God. And I'll close with John Stott as he summarizes what we've tried to look at today. The apostle has painted a vivid contrast between those who are under the law and those who are in Christ. And everyone belongs to one or the other category. If we are under the law, our religion is a bondage. Having no knowledge of forgiveness, we are still, as it were, in custody, like prisoners in a jail or children under tutors. It is sad to be in prison and in the nursery when we could grow up and be free. But if we are in Christ, we have been set free. Our religion is characterized by promise rather than law. We know ourselves related to God and to all God's other children in space, time, and eternity. Isn't that a great thought? Into eternity. And right now, the saints on earth and heaven, we're part of that family. Then he closes with this thought. We cannot come to Christ to be justified until we have first been to Moses to be condemned. But once you have gone to Moses and acknowledge your sin, guilt, and com condemnation, you must not stay there. We must let Moses send us to Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for a great and glorious salvation. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who has been poured out upon us and who makes us new, has made us new, and is making us new. So that we can hear the rest of the story. That we can now look at the law of God and say, there is beauty here. Because I want to live a life that honors the one who has saved me. So Moses leads us to Christ. And we rejoice in Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen.